Well, it's no secret. Uh, we have a problem in this country. We're losing 1.2 million uh, students every year to this idea of uh, dropout rate. And I'm having problems with the clicker here. Here we go. I apologize. In the wrong direction. <laughs> Let's start from the beginning. If I can deal with a tornado, I can deal with this. <laughs> All right, very good. Are we on? Ready to roll. Okay. So it's no secret. Uh, the communities across this country are losing students in an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented portion. Uh, American communities are losing approximately 1.2 million students every year. And it's a generational problem that stretches back decades. In fact, if you stop and think about this statistically, 1.2 million dropouts every year. Each one of those dropouts stands a 63% more of a chance of being incarcerated. Additionally, for the taxpayer, the cost over the course of a lifetime of that dropout is $292,000. When you think about that over the course of the next decade, 1.2 million students per year over 10 years, if nothing changes, we'll lose approximately 12 million students over the course of the next uh, decade. Uh, total cost to the taxpayer around $3 trillion. That's real money. As we think about uh, uh, this idea of the dropout rate, I think it's real important to recognize the fact that, uh, that we have unhealthy children growing up in unhealthy communities across this country. And granted, uh, public schools are partly to blame. I'm a part of that system. Uh, we work really hard to fix the problems that we have. But we also have a problem in the sense that we do have communities in this nation that have more liquor stores per capita than churches. And when that happens, uh, that creates a significant problem uh, for those communities, a cultural problem that runs very, very deep. And what I do know is that unless we all work together uh, in our community, uh, societal challenges such as the dropout rate, uh, teen pregnancy, drug abuse, homelessness, uh, can't be tackled by any, any one entity on its own. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story about uh, job in Missouri and some of the work that we've done over the course of the last uh, several years. I was hired in July of 2008 uh, to uh, take over the job in the school system. Uh, the school board was uh, very clear to me that uh, my responsibility was to improve the graduation rate in Joplin, uh, which at that time uh, stood at 72%. And during that time, um, uh, one of the challenges that we had, which there were many, we had a significant problem in terms of our, our parents. If you go back to 1996 in Joplin, Missouri, our graduation rate was 56%. And those children that I have currently, so parents, graduated around that time losing about one in every two. And so we also had a cultural problem in Joplin that had to be overcome. In addition, we had a significant drug problem in the Joplin community, uh, like so many communities across this country, but specifically in Joplin, Missouri, methamphetamines is a significant challenge that needed to be uh, taken care of. And beyond that, high poverty rates. We had a 62% per reduced lunch count in Joplin. Uh, and Missouri itself is one of the top five states, has a dubious honor of being one of the top five states in the nation uh, for the number of children to come from food insecure households. And we had another issue. We had a community that didn't own the problem. Uh, for many uh, people in the community, when I visited with them about the challenges of the dropout rate in Joplin, uh, the idea of them getting involved in helping us solve that problem was not something they even considered. In fact, they believed that the dropout problem in Joplin was a problem that was owned by the schools and a problem that we needed to solve on our own. So once again, we had a challenge that needed to be overcome and a lot of work that needed to be done. So we worked really hard over the course of the next several months, uh, building the partnerships and the relationships in our community, educating them on the challenges and opportunities that existed in our schools to get involved in, and be engaged in the life of our children. And as a direct result of that work, we were finally able to bring 150 community members to the table, leaders in our community, decision makers. And they listened. They listened to us tell, tell the stories about our children. Uh, they listened to us uh, uh, talk about some of the challenges that are, that are the obstacles and stand of our kids being able to learn and our teachers being able to teach, and they listen. Well, we had a group that was there that day, a very small group, that was significantly underrepresented. They'd been invited to the table, but they just didn't show up, and that was our faith community. Believe it or not, our churches weren't there. And what I came to realize was that they were very skeptical. This idea about churches being involved in the schools uh, was a problem also that needed to be overcome. And it came about as a result of this landmark decision back in 1948, McCollum versus Board of Education, where the Supreme Court uh, determined that it was a violation of the Establishment Clause for uh, schools to teach religion in, in, in their classrooms. 
And since that time, the walls between our faith community and our schools have been built wide, wide and tall. In fact, I remember in, in many of my administration classes as I was working towards my principal certification and later my superintendency certification, where I was told point blank, our entire class was told point blank, feature school leaders, that we had to hold our faith community at arm's length. Don't let them in your doors or you're asking for trouble, okay? And so that was a, a, another problem that we had to overcome. But uh, uh, over the course of the next uh, several weeks, we, we decided we're going to back up and try again. We're going to reach out to them and see if we could get our, our faith community engaged once, once again. And so we took a different approach. We leveraged the relationships, the peer-to-peer -peer relationships with our faith community. We got the pastors that were already on board to have conversations with other pastors, get them to the table. So we had a separate meeting just for them. We had 30 or 40 in the room. And we told the story once again of our children, uh, our sincere desire for them to be involved. And the end result of that conversation was we made very little progress until the very end of that meeting when a gentleman by the name of Steve Patterson uh, stood up in front of the group, one of our uh, uh, primary faith leaders in our community, and he made this statement. He said, folks, we know that we can't be the voice of God in our schools. That's already been proven constitu constitutionally wrong. We can't do it, and that's not the purpose of the work here. What we can do is be the hands of God and do the work that we're called to do by volunteering, tutoring, and mentoring students in these schools. And we have a school district willing to allow us to do that. And I've always referred to our, our faith community as a sleeping giant. And I can tell you, at that moment, they were now wide awake. And they got heavily engaged in the work that we were doing in our schools. So on the fast forward, January 2011, and some of you may recognize this. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, the whole philosophy of the work we're doing around kids is based on his work. Uh, Abraham Maslow, legendary psychologist. And if you stop and think, and let's, let's not talk about kids for a minute, let's talk about us as adults. I have two basic needs in my life. One is Starbucks, and the other is a good night's sleep. <laughs> for me to be highly successful at work, I have to have a good night's sleep and I have to have a cup of coffee every morning. If one of those two or both are missing, not much happens. I'm not as successful. I don't have a good day. I can tell you that today, last night, in Loveland, Colorado, just like in Joplin, Missouri, you had children that went to sleep. They were lucky on the couch, maybe on the floor. Okay? We have children coming to your schools. I know school was out yesterday in Loveland, Colorado. A lot of happy kids today, not so happy parents. <laughs> um, but uh, there, there are children who came to school yesterday with nothing, nothing in their stomach. And we stop and think about state assessments and how we assess kids and the work that we uh, require our students to do and the high expectations we have for teachers and students. Think about you as an adult when you don't have your basic needs met and how you perform uh, that next day and what we're requiring our kids to do on a daily basis when we as adults are not, are not filling those, those basic needs. So with that in mind, we developed a model. This is our framework that we work within. And uh, uh, kind of walking quickly through the model, I can only spend a little bit of time on, on a piece of it, uh, but that uh, word synergy in the middle is about the dialogue and the work that's going on between the, uh, our communities and our schools. It's a dynamic dialogue. A give and take. A lot of conversations are happening in place, taking place between our, our communities and our schools. Uh, we also uh, developed a capacity building component uh, where we build leadership capacity within our community by engaging the adults in conversations around the greater challenges within our schools, helping them understand our challenges and the opportunities that exist, where the gaps exist, and, uh, and, and giving them opportunities to plug themselves in. So it's about building leadership capacity in the community amongst adults by, uh, by creating knowledge. But the part that I want to talk about today and spend the most time on is this idea of time, talent, and treasure. Uh, the basic philosophy of this model is that, uh, that we believe that the resources exist in every community in this country. We just have to be creative in looking for those resources and connecting those resources to meet the needs of our children in our schools so they can be prepared to come to school, ready to learn, and be successful during the school day. And so um, uh, we also established the goal that uh, we would meet any child's basic needs within a 24-hour period. It's pretty aggressive in this day and age. And so we began that work. And I'm going to give you a, a, a quick story. I'm going to tell a quick story about this idea of, of uh, time, talent, and treasure. The best, I think, illustrates what I'm talking about. It's not time, talent, and treasure in tr traditional sense. Uh, in January 2011, I had the opportunity to go to one of my elementary schools. And the reason I was going over, the Community Foundation of the Ozarks uh, was had cut a check uh, for our uh, snack pack program, which is a backpack program for food insecure children. And uh, when I walked into the gymnasium for this, this assembly where this uh, presentation was going to take place, uh, what I noticed caught me 
by surprise, not the 230 kids, not with any elementary teachers in here, uh, sitting crisscross applesauce face in the front, you know, knees, legs across, hands in the lap, face in the front, being very polite as this assembly was about to begin. But the thing that caught me off guard when I walked in was that there were 230 kids sitting that way, and every single one of them had a hand and stocking cap on their head. Different sizes, different shapes, different colors. And so there was a parent that was to my left, and uh, I, I, I knew her, and I said, hey, what, what's up with all these stocking caps? And she said, you see those two ladies over there? And I looked off to my right, uh, far other, other end of the gym, and uh, she indicated to me that those two ladies uh, were uh, the representatives, their faith partner representatives from Faith Baptist Church, one of the most impoverished churches in our community in that part of town. And uh, they come together once a month with the rest of the site council at that particular school, and they talk about their children and what the needs are of those kids. And around Thanksgiving of that year, uh, they had had that conversation, and what came up, as you might expect, as you go into the winter months in a high poverty neighborhood, a needs of our, one of the needs of our kids is coats, hats, gloves, and things of that nature. Well, those two ladies took it upon themselves to tackle the challenge of hats on their own. What they did uh, was they, they uh, uh, over the course of a, a couple months between Thanksgiving and Christmas, actually a month, uh, they handed in 230 soccer caps for those children. 230. They had the time, they were retired and they were looking for a way to get back. They had the talent, their ability to knit, and the treasure, which is very non-traditional, was the yarn that they had in the closet. And when they ran out of yarn, they contacted their friends and neighbors that they also knew knitted, and, uh, and, and got additional resources, additional treasure to complete the project. And around Christmas, they gave uh, 230 stocking caps to those kids. Some of them got to, uh, uh, scarves as well that looked something like this. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you all, but when I look at these kids, and I look at the hats on their heads, I'm not sure how warm they're going to keep those children. In, in southwest Missouri, it can get pretty cold. But I can tell you, every one of those kids felt loved, and, I, and that is absolutely the most important thing. So, first step, we always go to our existing human... Uh, human resources, uh, existing resources in the community. Second step, which is also very exciting, is we use social media to a large degree to get the word out, uh, to make sure that we're able to meet the needs of our children uh, in a rapid response kind of way. And if we go to social media, I will tell you that the, the rapid response system, that 24-hour that window that I was telling you about looks more like 15 minutes. We can meet any kid's need within a 15-minute period once we put, uh, put that need out there, no matter what the need is. Uh, that includes Mandarin Chinese interpreters. We don't grow those on trees in southwest Missouri. Uh, that includes sleep apnea equipment for four-year-olds, preschoolers. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. We put it out there. We've got 6, 000, over 6,000 followers, and, they, and they, they make good things happen for, for our kids. But here's an example of what it looks like. It says, help, we have a high school girl in need of a nice outfit suitable for interviews. She is on her own and working hard towards graduation and finding employment. She will need a size large or extra large blouse and dress pants in size 13. She also needs a pair of nice shoes to match because, as we all know, shoes always make the outfit. That need was met in less than 15 minutes. Our community rallied around that, that child. And the demographic of that particular group, my Facebook followers on, on this particular page, is, uh, uh, is uh, soccer moms between the ages of 33 and 43, roughly, and they're highly competitive. And we put that need out there. That is absolutely fine to see who's going to help that kid. And so what ended up happening is we have a whole new list of resources. People would just call up and say, I never get a chance to help because I always get beat on Facebook. Would you just call me next time? It's been great. And the third tier that we have uh, to meet the needs of our kids is what we refer to as our High Needs Fund or Eagle Angel Fund, uh, which uh, we, just, we just go out and buy it if we have to. Okay? So uh, we had, the, the, had this uh, program in place, and uh, on May 22, 2011, as I went into work, I could point to uh, uh, 269 formal partnerships uh, between our faith community, our business community, and human service agencies. And we did that in the course of about nine months. <clears throat> and I'm glad we did. Because at 5.41 that evening, in the end, 5 tornado, Winds in excess of 200 miles an hour across our community. Over the course of six and a half.
half miles, spent 32 minutes on the ground, destroying everything that's packed. Destroyed 8,000 homes, damaged or destroyed 400 businesses, 18,000 vehicles, hit 10 of my schools, displaced 4,200 of my kids that no longer had school to go to. And we lost 161 friends and neighbors. Seven of them were my children and one staff. And when my wife and I crawled out of the basement after the storm and made our way into the community, these are some of the images, some of the things that we saw. There was no time to grieve. There was too much work to be done. It was two days later, after I was finally able to get my team together and my thoughts collected, made the announcement that we were going to start school on time, August 17th. 84 days later, and together, over the course of those 84 days, the partnerships we established in the community and the support of volunteers from across our country, we made it happen. And it looked kind of like this. <laughs> job was that when a community works together and are willing to receive help as well as give help, good things can happen. When you bring the right people to the table, leave politics aside, leave religious beliefs aside, leave competitions aside, bring folks to the table and have a conversation, you can overcome any obstacle. Nothing stops you. And I think that uh, 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 as I think about what happened to job what we've done is created a, a fabric, if you will, of interconnectedness. Our faith community was on board, our business community was on board, our human service agencies were on board, our parents were on board, and a direct result of that work, that fabric of inter interconnectedness, created the opportunity for us to have a shared purpose, and a shared vision, and we found our common ground in our children. Wouldn't it be nice if every country in our nation could act in that and behave in that same way? Every community in our nation behave in that same way. And what I can tell you as I stand here today, it's happening. It's happening in Joplin, Missouri. It's happening in the surrounding communities around Joplin um, as they get on board and we work together to provide the support that we need to protect our kids, to save our kids. And what I can tell you today as I stand here, I'm very excited. For the last five years, we've been working hard to get a handle on the graduation rate issue in job. job. I mentioned we had a graduation rate of 72% when I started this presentation. That represented 149 dropouts. In the class of 2013, we had 65 dropouts. We reduced the dropout rate by 67%. And I can tell you right now, as a community, we're not going to stop until we save them all. Thank you very much.